I want you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and I want to say Happy New Year. How many of you glad that 2020 has closed? I would say everybody. Uh, I, uh, I do want you to, I want to implore you, and uh, I want us to, as a body, thank you for those of you watching online, to uh, consider praying and just let's pray into Wednesday uh, uh, the 6th because they're picking the electors and there's a huge rally that's going on in Washington. And our prayer needs to be, God, let there be peace. Enough of the violence and the strife and the division. God, let there be peace. Amen? So uh, be in prayer for that. Also, uh, we want to pr probably continue praying on Saturdays. I had met with a couple that wanted to do it every Saturday, so I'll talk to Pastor Gabby and see what we do to keep praying for our nation. You know, if there's anything that's come out of 2020 is that the church is more awake today, I believe, yeah. than it was before. And you know what caused that to be? It was 2020. Really, yeah, the hardships, the lockdowns, and the losses. And how many of you went through difficulties in 2020? I think all of us did. Uh, some worse than others, and some better than others. But it, it created a uh, cry, and I want to tie that to today's message, because, you know, uh, God uses difficult seasons in our lives to always create a cry in us. And, and I want you to consider Israel. Israel has been in uh, Egypt for 400 years now. And I'm going back. So they've been in, in Israel, in Egypt for 400 years. The Bible says in Exodus 1 that uh, Pharaoh became to torment them and, and they became taskmasters. And, and, and that difficulty, the Bible says, created a cry on them. Here's what it says in Exodus 3. He said, and I, this is God saying, I heard their cry. I've seen their affliction, therefore I'm coming, and I have prepared for them a spacious land. It was the land of promise. Look at verse 9 of Exodus 3. It's right here. And God says, Behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen their oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Here's what God says. Therefore, I'm going to show them a spacious land that is filled with promises, a land of milk and honey. So what, what happened? The difficulty created a cry. God heard the cry, and he moved and began to bring them to an open, spacious place. So here's what happened. The man that is going to be used to bring freedom to them, he himself is in captivity because 40 years earlier, he has killed an Egyptian. And the Bible says that he fled because Pharaoh wanted to kill him. So he's now at the desert. Why would he live, leave the city? And going to a desert. Because God was trying to show him a new perspective, a new way of seeing. The difficulty, the accusations, the threats created a cry in Moses that would end up raising him up to become the deliverer of Israel. Now, consider this. Israel is captive 400 years. Moses is in a place of difficulty for 40 years. You and I have been through 2020. So if you had 20 plus 20, it was 40. Maybe 2020 was a year of testing so that we can see a new way of seeing into 2021. Amen? Because here's what happened. Israel got caught up into the conflict. They had seen a conflict of two kingdoms. Moses comes 
and start showing all these signs. And Pharaoh says, you don't know my signs. I'm going to bring my magicians. And they start turning their rods into serpents. You know the whole story, right? But, but Moses takes his rod and it turns into a, 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 a bigger serpent and it eats all the other ones. So Israel's watching all this stuff. And they've seen the battle of two kingdoms, just like you and I have seen the battle of two kingdoms this, this past year. But what it did for Israel, it created an opportunity for them to be delivered out of that season. What it did for Moses, it created an opportunity to see God in a total different perspective. What 2020 has done for us, I pray, is created a new way of seeing into 2021. That's a weak amen. Let me talk to the people online. As difficult as 2020 was, I think the church is more awake today than it's ever been. And I pray it does not stop. Because we have seen things that we never thought we would see in America. But you know what? I think the church has awakened to its purpose more than ever. And I don't know what 2021 brings, but I have a suspicion, and I'll share it with you. But here's what happens. If you read this, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 23 and 24, now they're out of the land of Egypt, right? They're in the desert. What does God do in the desert? There's no way of sustaining life. It's a difficult place, but somehow for breakfast, they get manna. If it gets cold, they have a pillar of fire. If it gets too hot, they have a cloud by day. I think they have it okay. But it's creating a mindset of hardness. And so here's what happens. He brought, look at verse 23. He brought us out. Why would he bring you out of this place? Why did he bring you out of 2020? Read it. To bring you in to 2021, right? But here's the principle you got to learn. That 2020 does not need to be the deciding factor of how you see your future. Israel messed up their ability to see because their hearts got hard. Because difficulties. And you'll see. I mean, you know, there's, there's room in my heart for sarcasm. Because I, I tend to be sarcastic at times. My wife tells me all the time. God bless their heart for putting up with me. Uh, but, but here's what I want you to consider. Here is the heart of God. He says, I brought you out to bring you in to give you the land which I have sworn to your fathers. So the Lord commanded us to follow all these statues to fear the Lord our God for our own good and for our own survival. God says, look, I heard your cry in Egypt. I brought deliverance to you. I work with Moses. Now you are out of Egypt, but you're still carrying Egypt into the desert. And it's going to cloud your vision of the promised land. Because you are going to either be victorious in the promised land or you're going to be victims. And you know the story. Ten of them saw the giants way too big. But two of them said, no, that will feed us and sustain us. So could it be possible that the people in Egypt forfeited their inheritance because their hearts got hard? Could it be that while they were in, in the desert, they forfeited their inheritance and only two entered into that promise? God says in Romans 15 and 1 Corinthians 10 that he gave all these examples to teach us and show us so that we will not make the same mistakes. So, so God is now into moving them to the promise. And God's always interested in you and I moving us into the promise. I would say that in 2020, uh, I, was, I was very shocked at how much corruption there is in our country. 
I don't know, maybe it's just me. I looked at, you know, how divided we are as a nation. I looked at the things that we're going through, and I'm saying, God, where does the church fit in all of this? I think the church needs to be the place where people come into and find the kingdom of God, and we find the peace of Christ in the middle of all the conflict. But really, the church is just as divided as the world. And here's what I'm saying to you. We've got to overcome that and move to a higher place, or we will forfeit the place God's prepared for us to see 2021 in a different light. Why is this so important? Because you know what? Every single time you see a battle between two kingdoms, it tends to wear you out. And the wearing out, uh-oh, I'm not supposed to preach? All right, Rick. Um, but in the, in the process of being wore out, what happens is we start getting hard, sarcastic. Oh, this is this, this is that. And we get accustomed to things that we are never to be accustomed with. I had a uh, young lady that came for our New Year's Eve. Believe it or not, Angie and I made it through midnight. I, I just, it's our first for a long time. Because Angie's bedtime is 9 o'clock. Mine is pretty close to that. But we made it through. And you know what? We entered into the new year with worship. But, but I, we, Brent had a uh, lady visiting with him from uh, Reading. And, and she said, the first thing I, I came into when I came to your church, because I went and met with her yesterday, when I met with you when, in, in a church, the first thing I, I, I felt is, there's a warmth in your church. Now, remember, she's coming from California. And people are hugging and touching. And, and she's like, what is this legal? Is this? Yeah. But think about it. We've gotten so accustomed to freedoms that sometimes we take them for granted. Here's what happened. So I said, what did you see? What did you sense? She said, I saw a big angel this is that night, Abe. I saw an angel, a huge angel in your church. And the angel had a scroll. And it had three stones, one gold, one uh, red, and one green. And I said, well, that witness is with me. I know, I know what it means. So she said, this angel was so big but yet when it came close to me, it got so low as if I was the same. Meaning that there's a place of authority in this house, but then there's a place of humility. And, and you know what? I, I said, so what, you know, so she started telling me all the stuff that she saw. And I asked myself, I left from meeting with her, and, and I asked this to Fernando, me, have we taken it for granted because we're so accustomed? And that's what Israel did. That's what they did in Egypt. That's what they did in the desert. And God's trying to create a new mindset. So what does Deuteronomy 4, have, uh, 4 has to do with any of this? I'm glad you asked. Watch this. Because God is now preparing a place for them to enter into a land doesn't have manna, doesn't have a cloud, doesn't have a pillar of fire, but it flows with milk and honey. And here's what he says, because I love this statement. Verse 32, if you would, Deuteronomy 4. It's right before the book of Revelation. This is what it says. Indeed, he's talking to Israel. Here's what he says. Indeed, Ask now concerning the former days, which were before you. In other words, I want you to start asking what happened before you went through all this conflict. And you know where he takes them? The God created man on earth and inquire from one end of the heavens to the other. What is God saying? Ask concerning what happened before you when God created man. When did he create man? Where did he put him? 
He's saying, go back to Eden and recover the purpose of the garden, which is called Eden, meaning my sweet delight. Why is God sending these people that have gone through Egypt, that are now in the desert, going all the way back to Genesis? Because God was trying to tell them, I've created you. You are made in my image. I've created you with purpose. Go back to the beginnings and don't allow the experience of Egypt or the desert or for you and I, 2020, to define your future. Because it's got nothing to do with it. So, so God says, look with me at verse 36. Or verse 32, let me finish. Has anything been done like this great thing, or has anything been heard like it? Verse 36, out of the heavens, he let you hear his voice to discipline you. Oh, boy. How many of you ever heard his voice and it disciplines you? Let me ask you a question, practically. How many of you have said something out of that you didn't mean to, but then you're hearing this voice and he says, go apologize. One person? Wow. We are in the right place. But here's what God says. I, I speak to you because I love you. I want you to go back to the beginning. This is my purpose. You are created in the garden of my delights. I'll speak to you and I'll discipline you. Let me continue. Because he loved, verse 37, because he loved your fathers, therefore he chose your descendants. After them, I love his language. He personally brought you out from Egypt by his great power. Well, how did you do it? Driving out from before you nations that are greater, mightier than you, to bring you and to give you their land for inheritance as it is today. Therefore, today, take it to your heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, on earth below, and there is no other. What was he trying to tell them? Forget Pharaoh in Egypt. Forget your experiences. I rule the heavens and I rule the earth. Focus on me. Yeah. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to focus on the wrong thing and you're going to start judging your future based on past experiences. Yeah. And, and for, for us, I will say that 2020 was a difficult year. We saw people that went through hardships, difficulties, but yet at the same time, do you know that in the middle of all the difficulties, lockdowns, uh, people, because we were locked down, people were given ideas of new businesses and they started them and they were successful. Why? Because God can take whatever you're going through and make an open door for you. But you cannot allow the sarcasm of the culture that you're living in to blind you from seeing the future. Because it does tend to do that to us. And, and you and I have to get to the point where we say, God, what do you have for me in the future? Well, but I've gone through this, I went through this, and I went through that. God is not oblivious to that because he said, I had heard your cry, I've seen your affliction, therefore I'm coming. You see, sometimes the places of difficulty create a cry in all of us. So God will waste nothing. But don't judge God by your experience. In the past three years, and I'm not judging anybody. In the past three years, I have seen people reduce God to their experience. And God's way above that. Well, but this didn't happen for me. There's a lot of things that didn't happen to me. 
You know, I heard Johnny giving testimony about this miracle and this happened. I'm like, uh, Lord, <laughs> how many of you ever felt like that? It's like, you hear this, you hear that, and you're like, what about me? Listen, rejoice when someone gets blessed. Really rejoice. Because if you don't, you'll develop this attitude, God doesn't love me. Look at what's happening to that one. Look what's happening to this one. I'm believing and nothing's happened. I've been standing, nothing's happened. If you do that, what we start doing, and I've done it, we start reducing God to our own experience. So here's the question. Israel came out of Egypt with a hardened heart because of the conflict. They came out of the desert. Well, they didn't come out of the desert. It was the next generation. With a difficult heart to believe, though they saw the miracles. How are we going to come out of 2020? Because it's been all also a year of testing for some of us. It's been a year of difficulty. And, and you know what? I don't have the answer to that. All I can tell you is that the conflict of Egypt in the desert made them hard. Which tells me I need to watch over my heart that my heart stays tender towards God. Why am I saying this? Because when I was praying, I asked God, God, why are you showing me this? Because every single time I'm about to do something new, I bring them out of a situation such as he did in Egypt. Moses says, let my people go for three days to worship. Why did he want to get them out of there for three days? Because he wanted to give them a glimpse of the promised land. Why did he take Moses out of Egypt? Because he was trying to show him a new way of seeing. Why did he do all of this? Because you and I need a new way of seeing 2021. Or it will be attached to an experience that created loss. Does that make sense? So, so here's the question that each generation has been asked. And here's the question you need to answer. What is God showing me for 2021? Because typically the question is asked out of the preacher. And I'm putting it right back on you. What is God showing you for 2021? I'm glad you asked. Go with me to the book of Mark, chapter 8. Believe it or not, I have two scriptures. I'm going to quote some, though. Jesus is brought into a city called Bethesda. Bethesda. It's amazing because he does a miracle, but he does not do it where he was brought into. Think about this. Mike, this might want to mark this on your notes. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus indicts this city in Chorazin because they had seen more miracles than any other city. Then they still rejected him. So Jesus comes to this city to do a miracle, but in order to do the miracle, he's got to get the guy out of the city. Why? The same reason... He had to get Israel for three days into a place of worship so they can see the promised land. The same reason he got them into the desert, took 12 and said, I want you to go spy out the land. The same reason you and I have the opportunity to see God move in 2021 and say, God, give us the greatest harvest of souls that we've ever seen in our lives. I'm not going to let the difficulties of 2020 define my future. And listen, there's already rumors there's a COVID 2020 because there's a new strain. You know what? It might be an opportunity for governments to try to control us and move us and do this and do that. What are we going to do? 
Think about it, I, because there are states. Listen, I talk to people out of the country that are going through lockdowns like you and I have never experienced. They get a code twice a week to go out shopping for groceries and or medical needs. That's it. That's all they get. Some of you that have lived in those, or if you're watching from another country, you know what I'm talking about. But we, we're so blessed. And sometimes we take it for granted and don't recognize what God's doing in the middle of the conflict. And God is saying, I want you to recover the eyes to see so that 2020 does not become the barometer of where you're going. So watch Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And they came to Bethesda, and they brought the blind man to him, and he entreated him to touch him. He is in the city that has seen more miracles than any other city. What, what does Jesus do? Does he heal him? Verse 23, taking the blind man by the hand, brought him out of the village, and after spitting on his eyes and laying hands on his hand, hands on, on him, he, after spitting on his eyes and laying hands upon him, he asked him, what do you see? That, why did he have to spit on him outside of the city? Have you ever asked that? Because the scene, the city has seen so many miracles, they probably would have judged that miracle and said, that's not the way you heal. Consider God does some amazing things sometimes. He spends... I don't know how many chapters in the book of Leviticus to speak about ravens considered a filthy animal. Later on, he takes that same animal and feeds the prophet with that animal. Well, why didn't he pick a doe? I don't have the slightest idea. All I know is that sometimes he does things to assault our view to create a cry and see into the future. And what God is saying is, I am bringing this man out of the city because what I'm about to do in your culture, in the culture they're living in, when you spit on someone's eyes or face, it was an insult. It was a sign of insult. I mean, how would you take it? If the pastor called you up and said, I need to spit on your eyes, especially in the light of COVID, the droplets, how many droplets are coming to me? Isn't that the way we think about it? We think that way. So what does God do? Jesus takes him out of the place that are accustomed to miracles. And does something that to you, or that, not to you, but to that city could have been the most insulting thing. And does the miracle, and he, he has the nerve to say, what do you see? Like Jesus doesn't know. He does. Watch this. And verse 24, and he looked up and said, I see men. For I am seeing them like trees walking about. Then again, he laid hands on him, on his eyes. And he looked intently and was restored and began to see everything clearly. Why did he take them out of the city? Why did he take Moses out of the city? Why did he take Israel out of the city? To give them a new way of seeing why is that? Could it be possible that maybe the conflict of the city has blinded their eyes? Let me give you some ideas for you and I to think about. 
Number one, step out of your conflict. Take some time with God and say, God, what are you showing me? Because we go through this on a weekly basis. We go through this every day. And our conflict becomes so real that we cannot see anything beyond our conflict. I'm speaking for myself. Number two, don't make your conflict or your need your daily focus. Because if you do, it's going to blind you to what God's trying to do with you. This one's going to touch you. Number three, stop the voices of your village. All of us have a village. I have one. It's called family. Sometimes it's difficult. How many of you have? Sometimes it's difficult because they think you're crazy or you're like believing this and what is this and what? what, what? Especially if you believe in the supernatural, they're going to really think you're crazy. You've been believing for that and nothing's happened. You're wasting your life. You're doing this. You're spending this. Come out of your village and let God touch your eyes. Number four, focus on what God's doing, not what he hasn't done. You, you know, my wife and I see life totally different. She sees the cup half full, more. She said, half empty. Which one's right? Don't start judging now. Because there's one of you in every family. But you see, sometimes we tend to focus, especially in the culture that we are living in. It's very sarcastic. I had this lady come and tell me, I have a prophetic word. I'm like, okay, I, I, I know her will. And she started singing that song, uh, what is it called, The Generations, The Blessing. And your children and your children, they will pay the taxes for what we're borrowing today. And I'm like, you just messed up my song. It's one of my favorite songs. It's like, why do you do that to me? So you know what? Every time we sing that song, I'm thinking of the omnibus bill. Who's going to pay for it? My children and their children and their children. I'm like, why are you doing that? So now I got to step out of the village, try to hear the song away from this. We're living in a society that, that, that has become hard because of the conflict. We need a church that's tender, able to see the future, able to believe God for souls. You know, sometimes you'd be surprised, the people that are the most difficult. You think about Paul. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He was literally a terrorist. He was killing people, church people. And God chooses him to write two-thirds of the New Testament? God chooses a raven to feed a prophet? Don't write anybody off. We've got to start believing for the miraculous and believing for the miracles and believing God 2020 was a tough year. It was a year testing for me but I know you brought me out of 2020 to bring me into 2021 so that I can see with different eyes. I think, the, the number, number five, I think this year he's going to teach us a new way of seeing things. You know, for me, when I heard the testimony, I spent a couple hours with her yesterday, uh, and all that she saw in this house, I thought, Lord, I, 
at times take it for granted of what we have. For her to come and just shake hands. How many of you know when this COVID started, it was like, do I, can we shake hands? Do we bump? We started doing the, we didn't know, did we? So she comes from a, from a, from a city that's like in lockdown to come experience the warmth of Encourager Church. She looked at me and she said, you really don't know what you guys have. And I, I got convicted. You talk about the voice disciplining uh, from heaven. I got convicted because I thought, Lord, we're so used to it. So, so watch what Jesus does. Because he would have to answer this question. Or you would have to answer this question. Because now he sees everything. Verse 26. This is the blind man that now sees. Look what it says. And he sent him to his home saying, someone help me. Don't enter the village. Why? Because there's so much sarcasm in the village that it is going to compromise the way you're now seeing. Don't visit 2020 and bring it into 2021. Why is this? Let me just give you one more scripture. Jeremiah chapter 1. Because... Each generation has to answer this question. Now, I'll make it short. But every generation from the beginning of time to today has had to answer this question, what do you see? And really, a lot of times, your experience dictates the way you see, and it shouldn't be. So he takes a prophet. His name is Jeremiah, obviously, chapter 1. And this prophet does not believe in himself. God is speaking to him and saying, you need to be a prophet to the nations. And he's saying, no, not me. I don't even know how to speak. I'm young. I don't know how to do all this stuff. And God asked him this question. Look what it says in verse 11. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, someone help me. What are you seeing? Do you see what I'm showing you based on who you think you're not? Or do you see what I'm saying based on what I'm trying to reveal to you? And so he says, well, I see a rod of an almond tree. What has that got to do with anything? Here's what what you have to realize. And that is that The almond tree is called the wakeful tree. It's the first tree to wake up from wintertime. So what God literally was saying to Jeremiah is, I want you to be awake to what I'm seeing, to what I'm showing you before everybody else sees it. But you cannot have the attitude you have. You have a bad image of yourself. And you're not going to be able to see into the future. Look what he says. Next question. Verse 13. Again, he says, what do you see? And of course, the prophet answers, a boiling pot. What in the world does that have to do with anything? I'll tell you what it does. Boiling pot, if you read the Old Testament, it always means war. So could it be possible that God was saying to Jeremiah, I'm waking you up before anybody else sees that there's a war coming, but I'm showing it to you because it's going to be a year, a season of victory for you. And I will tell you the two things that I feel the Lord spoken to me. This should be one of the greatest years of intimacy with you, with God. But you've got to come out of your village. You've got to stop the voices of your village. Number two, this may be a year of war. 
but don't run away from the war. Are you prophesying 2020? No, 2020 is gone. Can you say amen to that one? But here's what I'm saying. God has always had people that face the conflict. When, when he takes Ezekiel, I, 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 said, I share this a little bit in uh, New Year's Eve. He takes a, a, a Ezekiel, who is a captive in the valley of in, in Shabar, the city of Shabar in Babylon, and he gives the date, the, the, the fifth year, the day, the time. I'm like, okay, so you're interested in the date we are living in. And by the time he gets to verse 4 of chapter 1, the Bible says, I saw a storm coming. Now, sandstorms are very common in the Middle East. So typically, if you see a storm coming, what do you do? You turn around, you cover yourself, and you run the other way, right? You know what Ezekiel does? He does the opposite. He runs towards the storm, and it says, but in the middle of the storm, or in the midst of the storm, there was the glory of God. Could it be? that we need to not be afraid of 2021, but face it right on, knowing that God is on our side. Ezekiel did. is one of the most magnificent, my favorite book in the Old Testament. Look what it says in verse 18 and 19 of Jeremiah 1. I close with this. Because this is what he said to Jeremiah after seeing what he saw. Behold, I have made you today a fortified city, a pillar of iron with walls of bronze against the whole land to the kings of Judah, to its princesses, to its priests, to its people of the land. They are going to fight against you, but they are not going to overcome you. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. God showed him the almond tree. God showed him the boiling pot. But he says, don't be stressed about it. Nothing is going to overcome you. You need to run into the storm. And I'm saying to you with all due respect, let's run into 2021 without any reference to 2020. Because I'm telling you, if there's anything we need to start believing for is breakthrough for America. And start believing, God, awaken my soul. I've gotten too accustomed to my village. Would you stand with me? How about you come out of your village today and say, God, are you showing me a boiling pot? I'm not saying that. He did that with Jeremiah. But I'm saying to you that I believe your vision is the very thing God is after for. Your vision needs to go beyond your today. But it cannot be based on the voices of the village. Because in the village, they're too accustomed to the supernatural. They don't even recognize it anymore. So just close your eyes and just pray. Father, we just pray today that as we look to 2021, we would face it for what it is, and we will face it with an attitude of victory because we know you are with us. I pray for an awakening over our nation. I pray you break the divisions. I pray you break the hatred. I pray you come and invade territory of every single area of our society. And Lord, what you've exposed, the corruption in Washington, all the stuff that happens, God, we just come and ask you to even invade Washington, D.C. with your presence, oh God.
Lord, that we would pray for our brothers in California and New York, the churches that are shutting down, and we would say, God, thank you for the country of Texas, but God, we're praying for every single city, every single church, every single family that is going through difficulties, and we say, God, break this thing over them. Break this thing over their, heart, their heads. God, I pray that you create in us a tender heart to see new beginnings, God. We bless you and we honor you in Jesus' name. I, I will say I will not end a service without asking if you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord. Look, I see a climax of conflicts. And Jesus is either going to come soon or the church is going to rise into the greatest conflict that will give the church one of the greatest harvests of souls that we could ever have. And I don't want to go to heaven without taking as many souls as I can. And I'm going to start with my family, with my village, and I'm going to start with the people that, that need to hear the gospel. And so, Father, right now, I just pray that you give us eyes to see the next generation, our villages, that, God, you would save our sons, daughters, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Lord, we lift up this next generation that, God, you would use them and push into them and fuse into them the power of the Holy Ghost. That, God, they would take the kingdom to all the four corners of the world. Because God, we want to see you move in a time like this. It looks like conflict, but to you, it looks like an opportunity for victory in Jesus' name. So Father, if you've never given your life, all you have to do is just, let's all pray together. Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. In Jesus' name. That's all you have to do. Make him Lord of every single day of your life. We're going to pray right now if you need prayer today. If you're battling a sickness. Maybe you're battling the voices of the village. Maybe you need to say, God, I need this morning to shut down the voices of the village. Maybe 2020 was a hard year for you. Can you just pray right now, as we, if you need prayer, that God would take this thing and just begin to wipe it away so we don't judge the future based on this past experience. Amen? Let's worship the Lord one more time before we leave. This will be my song you are Church, God bless you. If you need prayer, come up front. Those of you joining us online, thank you for joining us. We will meet again Wednesday night and uh, next Sunday, same time, 1045. God bless you. Have a great week and happy new year to everyone here. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming today.